Hello, this is Miss Augustine, and we are continuing our notes for Chapter 6. This time we are Chapter 6, Part 4, and we're still talking about covalent bonding, but today we're going to introduce the concept of hybridization. And the definition is the mixing of two or more atomic orbitals of similar energies in the same atom that results in new orbitals of equal energies. And we just give you a little brief taste of this in honors chemistry. If you go on to study chemistry with the AP level or in college, you will spend a lot more time on it, but we're just going to give you a little taste of it. So orbitals can combine and rearrange. And again, this allows for the electrons in the orbitals to be far apart from one another, and it has a little bit to do with Vesper theory as well. And so when we're talking about these hybridized orbitals, again, the definition is orbitals of equal energy produced by the combination of two or more orbitals of the same atom or in the same atom. And there are three types we talk about, sp, 1s and 1p orbital, sp2, 1s and 2p orbitals, and sp3, 1s and 3p orbitals. And this is the major one that we'll talk about at this point. So the example would be carbon, which has the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And so we're concerned here with the two uh, s's and the two p's. So there are four valence electrons, the two in the s orbital and two in the p sublevel. And this hybridization will result from the s orbital and the p orbitals combining. And they will hybridize to form four sp3, so-called sp3 orbitals, indicating which orbitals are involved, three of the p's and one of the s, and you get four equivalent orbitals. So there are four new identical bonds that can be formed. So now carbon goes ahead and makes those four bonds that we've been talking about previously in this chapter. So sp3 contains 1s and 3p orbitals, and that resulting shape, since there are four orbitals, would be tetrahedral. An example would be for methane, and again, the tetrahedral shape would look like that. So now we're going to move to what I call Chapter 6, Part 5, and we're going to talk a little bit about properties of these molecular compounds. And remember, molecular compounds are defined as compounds that contain covalent bonds. So some properties of molecular substances. They can exist in all three states of matter, and their melting points and boiling points tend to be low compared to ionic compounds. Some exceptions would be network solids that have that are stable substances in which all the atoms are covalently bonded to one another, but because they have a lot of intermolecular forces of attractions between them, they tend to have much different properties as far as melting and boiling points compared to your normal run-of-the-mill molecular substances. And again, in network solids, everything is interconnected, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So two examples would be diamond and silicon carbide. So then we also talk in this portion of the chapter about allotropes. And the definition of allotropes are different forms of an element, and they're different because they have different types of bonding. And so several elements have allotropes, um, but the one we talk about in this chapter at this point in chemistry is carbon, and carbon has three allotropes. The first one is graphite, and with graphite you have, again, all that's in this is carbon, but you have these plates that are attracted to one another, and so they're actually like sheets. And so the way graphite, and this goes on and on, you know, in all directions, um, but the reason that uh, graphite is unique is that because of the way these little sheets are, um, graphite can slide over itself, and that's what makes it a good lubricant. A second 
allotrope of carbon, and my personal favorite is the diamond. And here are three pictures of the diamond. And again, you have all of these um, six-membered rings, but they're all kind of attracted to one another, so it forms this kind of a network, and it gives it very, very, um, very, very high melting and boiling point, and it's very hard. Um, and then a third allotrope that we talk about are Buckminster fullerenes, or buckyballs, as they're sometimes called. And these have this funny shape. They look like soccer balls. And this one is a C60 example, but you can have ones with many, many more carbons. But what's unique about them is that they have this ball shape. And um, they're named after Buckminster Fuller, who was a guy that was into um, geodesic domes. And so they're fondly referred to as buckyballs, and it stands for Buckminster Fullerenes. And so now we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are these interactions between um, the atoms within molecules. And so and it's, it's an attractive force that operates between molecules. And it is not a bond, so we have to remember that these intermolecular forces are much weaker than bonding forces. However, they still account for physical properties like boiling point and freezing point and um, hardness and things like that. And so bonds are attractive forces that holds atoms together in molecules, but these intermolecular forces are much weaker and they are still at play. And there's three of them that we talk about. So the first one we talk about are Van der Waals forces, and they are a collection of weak interactions. So we talk about London dispersion forces, we talk about dipole dipole forces, and we talk about hydrogen bonding forces. So we're going to take them one at a time. So London dispersion forces are the attraction between temporary dipoles in molecules. So again, you're going to say, what? So Electrons are in constant motion, remember, and they aren't always equally distributed. So if you have nonpolar molecules like chlorines or hydrogens or oxygens, and the electrons are equally distributed between the atoms, however, when one atom comes near another atom, or one molecule comes near another molecule, their electrons are what encounter one another, and electrons repel each other. So what happens is, as these molecules come close to each other, the electrons disperse. They get as far away as they can. And so you have something called a temporary dipole that forms. And again, this temporary dipole, or induced dipole, gives that molecule, which would be normally nonpolar, because it's encountering another molecule, it gets a slight negative and positive region. And again, that is the only really intermolecular force that goes on in nonpolar substances. And the effect would pass to other atoms, kind of like a domino effect. And so this induced dipole, so the molecule is coming near another molecule, eh, they repel, the electrons get away from each other, and then it bounces in another direction, those electrons go back where they were. So it's kind of like a, a domino effect. What do we know about them? They occur between all atoms and molecules. They are the only intermolecular force at work in nonpolar substances, and they are relatively weak. So what do we know about these London dispersion forces? They tend to be stronger as the molecule gets larger. So therefore, if you think about at room temperature, the halogens, so that's group 17 on the periodic table, chlorine would be toward the top of that column. It's a gas at room temperature. Bromine, much bigger, is a liquid. Again, these are these intermolecular forces of attraction. And iodine is a solid at room temperature. So again, that is the result of the London dispersion forces. As the molecules are getting bigger, you're going from gas to liquid to solid. The second kind is the dipole-dipole force. We talked about that a little bit when we looked at what a hydrogen or a water molecule looks like with the hydrogen end being positive and the 
oxygen and being negative. So these are attractions among polar molecules. And electronegativity of atoms is what determines which part is the positive and which part is the partial negative, as in water. But water molecules are attracted to one another because of this dipole-dipole force. So again, the positive and negative parts will attract one another in adjacent molecules. And then hydrogen bonding is a special case of a dipole-dipole force. It is the strongest of the dipole-dipole forces. And again, it's between polar molecules that contain hydrogen attra attached to a highly electronegative element. And we say NOF, so NOF said, N-O-F. So hydrogen bonding is exhibited between hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Those are where hydrogen bonds tend to form. And although there is no bond between molecules in the usual sense, hydrogen bonding is a strong force. And hydrogen bonding is the special type of dipole-dipole interaction. So that is really it for now. We're going to, uh, I'm going to pause and sign off here, and the next portion of our notes will cover ionic bonding. So this is Ms. Augustine signing off.